Demokratie. Europa ist eben viel mehr. Zusammenarbeit zwischen den Völkern. Frieden. Bürger der Europäischen Union. I was quite skeptic about the EU because yeah, Estonia was in one union for a long time and just to step right to the, into the other but uh, now I have realized that it's actually been a very good thing for Estonia. Estonia has been a member of the European Union since 2004. It has more than 1,500 offshore islands. Our pilot, Karel Lochmus, touches down with us on the grass landing strip on the island of Ruchnu. Our plane has been eagerly awaited. Estonia's smallest community, numbering just 60 inhabitants, is completely dependent on supplies being flown in. And here, on this remotest of islands, Karel raves about how EU membership has opened his country to the world. The world is open for us, for, for, for younger people like me, so you can work outside in the European Union, you, have, uh, you can travel, you can meet other people, you can live in other countries, so it's, it's, it's like an open society. You can, you can, you can have like an open mind. And... We were in Estonia more than 10 years ago to ask people what they expected from accession to the European Union. Now we're back, and we want to know how things have gone in Estonia since then. Our trip will take us from Ruchnu to the island of Sarima, where we'll meet a fisherman's family. Then we'll go on to the capital, Tallinn, where we'll talk to a successful businessman. In Narva, on Estonia's eastern border, we'll find out how the integration of the Russian minority is progressing. In the university town of Tartu, we'll visit a young Estonian woman, and we'll end our journey on the island of Muhu. This is how we remembered Sarima, Estonia's largest island. Thinly populated, like the entire country, with just 1.3 million people. When we first got to know fisherman Yuri Suik on the island in 1999, coastal fishing was scarcely worth the effort. The forthcoming EU accession gave him cause to hope. These days his catch is still small. EU membership hasn't helped in that respect. Overfishing in the Baltic Sea has left simple fishermen without a chance. So when we meet Yuri again, he tells us he's given it up as a trade. It's easy to see that that still upsets him. He tells us wistfully that he'd been a professional fisherman all his life. Now Yuri lives alone on his farm. He tells us he didn't really have much luck with his wife. His eldest daughter, Mariana, takes care of him. His two other daughters have gone abroad. Estonia is experiencing an exodus of its young people. At 62, Yuri has taken early retirement. 
Like many older Estonians, he has a pension that barely covers his living costs. Yeah, I'm happy. He assures us he's optimistic. He says that things could be better, but in typical Estonian fashion, he adds that you just have to be contented with your lot. Back in 1999, Yuri and his wife had a small farm together. At the time, Marit was proud of her purebred sheep. Now the animals are gone, and so is she. We trace down Marit Suik in a nearby village. With EU funding, she's opened her own shop, selling Estonian handicrafts. As a memento of our last visit, she's kept a newspaper article from a time when she still had high hopes. Marit tells us she's lost two jobs in the past few years and that she'd never imagined she'd ever be self-employed. She keeps up her courage by telling herself you must be active, entrepreneurial and believe in yourself and not complain. Being self-employed is now her only option because jobs, like those in this factory making fishing nets, are few and far between on the island. Although Estonia is no longer a low-wage country, it's still an attractive location for foreign investors, especially Scandinavian businesses, such as this Danish fishing equipment manufacturer. Tallinn, the capital, is the economic heart of the country. We recognize Thomas Tamsa immediately, a businessman for whom the past few years have been quite tumultuous, as he tells us. He says the years from 2004 to 2008 were economically fantastic in Estonia, but that now many things have changed. Now the unemployment rate is very high, he says, and that's especially hard for people with families and children to support. Estonia was once considered a shining example of radical free enterprise. Now, during the global financial crisis, the government is resolutely economizing and cutting the budget and pensions to fulfill the criteria for the euro. We accompany our businessman friend to an appointment in the old city centre, where we notice at second glance the many surveillance cameras. Medieval buildings with modern touches. And laptops are everywhere. In technology-mad Estonia, a law even guarantees the right to free internet access. <laughs> Thomas Tamsa is well linked up and stays networked. Today he's meeting a German hotelier to discuss an upcoming event. Since we last saw him, Thomas has started up his own business, organizing conferences. Back in 1999, at the relatively young age of 32, he was the manager of a seatbelt factory. He was one of the new generation of business people in Estonia. The once reserved manager is now a self-confident entrepreneur. He takes us to Tallinn's business district. He tells us EU accession has given the country a boost, and we can see that clearly. I 
He says he's profited from the EU because he took advantage of the strong boost it gave to economic growth. His conference on wage development also focuses on the global financial crisis. Thomas Tamsa remains optimistic, but he thinks his fellow Estonians ought to be more committed to their country. He says the basic democratic process is in place, but that citizens' action groups haven't progressed far enough. He thinks Estonians should play a more active role than they do now. Thomas takes us to the new statue on Freedom Square. It commemorates the country's struggle for independence in 1918, which the Estonians won. But in 1940, first the Soviets occupied the country, and then the Third Reich. In 1944, the Soviet Union annexed Estonia, and held it until 1991. <laughs> Thomas Tamsa tells us Estonians have lived with the dream of liberty and believed in it since the Second World War. He thinks that for slightly older people, it's really a sacred concept. Before we drive on, he says we absolutely must take a look at the new art museum, the Kumu a surprisingly large building for such a small country. The way it presents a wide array of Estonian artists seems to us to be a sign of the growing national self-confidence here. Some visitors, however, also come to see artworks typical of the Soviet era. Our journey continues northeastwards. We arrive in Estonia's problem region, a landscape dotted with dilapidated industrial plants. When we visited earlier, environmental pollution was rife. Back then, yellow sulfur dust covered the countryside. The sulfur is no longer visible now. The EU requires filters. Nonetheless, with oil shale still being extracted here, the air and soil remain very polluted. Estonia's primary source of energy is still the country's largest environmental problem. We've been warned about the long lines of trucks outside Narva, waiting to be processed by Russian customs. Drivers complain about Russian harassment. Relations with Estonia's giant neighbor are frosty. In 2007, there was even unrest when a Soviet memorial was moved in Tallinn. The eastern border of Estonia is now an external border of the EU. It's closely policed. Two fortresses face each other on the Estonian-Russian border. More than 90% of the population of the industrial city of Narva is of foreign descent. The Soviet Union once settled Russian-speaking workers here. Now many of them are unemployed. What strikes us is that the new signs on house corners now bear Estonian and not Russian names. The government is trying to establish the Estonian language here as well. 
We drive to Narva's power plant, where oil shale is used to generate electricity. Here we meet Ilya Kutis, a Russian worker who unloads freight wagons as they arrive. On our earlier visit, the working language was Russian, and Ilya's job was the same as it is now. Back then, he was very optimistic about the country's pending EU accession. He expected Russians here to be able to get Estonian citizenship and travel abroad with EU passports or open their own businesses. Things have developed differently. He now says the most important change for him was his marriage, and not Estonia's EU accession. Narva is still predominantly Russian-speaking. The government's language and integration programs scarcely reach the older generation. Integrating them into society remains difficult. Many here see themselves as losers and are angry that, since EU accession, they have to pay for a visa to go to Russia. Ilya, too, is disappointed with the EU and looks to his private life for happiness. Little is left of the hope he placed in the European Union. Although he has an Estonian passport, like many ethnic Russians in Estonia, he thinks the integration policies have failed, as have attempts at rapprochement. Ilya tells us he doesn't think Russians here are particularly glad to have EU passports. He says many of them would trade their EU citizenship for a Russian passport. From the northeast, we travel on to the south. Every day, Celia Helvisti rides her new motorbike several kilometers from the city of Tartu to her place of work. The company she works for makes garden sheds from timber, one of Estonia's principal raw materials. Wood products are among the country's main exports. Celia works in marketing and sales. She's taking pictures for the new catalog. She tells us her life has changed a great deal during the past 10 years. She finished university and then got this good job, which, she says, offers her many opportunities for advancement. Celia showed this same eagerness for education and training the first time we met her. Back then, she was a student, getting ready for European Union accession at the University of Tartu. Celia has remained true to her university town. Just as it's always been, Tartu is still the country's main educational center. And well-educated young citizens are Estonia's most valuable asset. Celia proudly shows us her new apartment. She seems to have done well in the intervening years.
She bought the apartment together with her boyfriend, who's on a business trip at present. Celia has profited from her language skills. Lately, she's added French to the list, and soon, she tells us, she might study Arabic. Young Estonians are probably more committed to the EU because it enhances their opportunities. On her last holiday, she went to Switzerland. She says she could also imagine working there sometime. Before we leave, she tells us about her own plans for the future. Im Moment bin ich mit meinem Leben ziemlich zufrieden. She says she's very satisfied with her life at present. She and her boyfriend have also been thinking about starting a family. That would be lovely for Celia and good for Estonia. The small republic has one of Europe's lowest birth rates. We travel onwards. The ferry takes us to the island of Muhu, the last leg of our journey. Muhu is a byword for unspoilt nature in Estonia, with bears, wolves, lynx, deer, and all sorts of wildlife. In a secluded spot, we come upon Pedeste Manor. The 1300 manor houses in Estonia used to belong to German aristocrats, who ruled the country for more than 700 years. Pedeste was renovated with the aid of EU subsidies, and it's now a luxury hotel, with guests from around the world. <laughs> A bit further on the island, we run into tour guide Anna Kuripalu, whom we got to know on our last visit. She's meeting up with Martin Kiviso, an old schoolmate. Both are true nature lovers and keep a close watch on the environment in their country. They had high hopes for EU accession. I think that very many places in nature are much better now. We have much less pollution thanks to EU. I have seen it during my last 10 years traveling around Estonia that rivers which were full of pollution 10 years ago, now salmon and trout has returned. In 1999, Anna Kuripalu was working as a guide in Lahema National Park in northern Estonia. Even then, she was convinced the country's pristine nature would attract tourists. When Estonia will be a uh, member of EU, uh, then uh, those countries who haven't this all left, they can come here and enjoy. Maybe this is that part what Estonia can give to EU, uh, unspoiled nature. And here they are, the hoped-for tourists. These Finns are on Martin's horses, exploring old cult sites. Martin inducts them into the mystical world of pre-Christian customs. To us, it has a mysterious quality. In front of a sacred boulder, grain is offered to the gods. As I always say, I am a free person in a free country. I like independence and freedom very much. To Martin Kivisu, the horses of Muhu symbolize Estonians' identity and culture and their age-old love of freedom. Where is this mine? My silver grouse. Before we leave, Martin shows us his project for the future on his property. 
a center dedicated to pre-Christian civilizations, built with EU aid. And he takes leave of us with his personal views on Estonia and the European Union. As he puts it, people can be happy with or without the EU, but they have a better chance of succeeding in the EU. By the end of our trip, we've seen that European Union membership has vastly increased the opportunities available in Estonia. And we have the impression that many Estonians have made use of them.